Toda a bagunça que tá na cozinha, só você que fez, tá? Sim, sim. We learned that shaping data for public good is possible. With our funders and project partners, 12 regional research hubs that coordinated the involvement of more than 100 researchers, and our six thematic partners, the first edition of the Global Data Barometer examined the availability, governance, capability, and use of data across 109 countries. Join us to shape the future of data policy. Explore the state of data around the world at www.globaldatabarometer.org. I hope that the barometer is used as a starting point. I hope that the barometer will help countries make better decisions on data strategies. Learned is that even in more developed democracies, we still do not have access to all the data sets we need. Welcome, um, greetings to you all, and thank you for joining us today for this very exciting launch of the first edition of the Global Data Barometer. We will hear today more about how this uh, exercise has been progressing, very exciting news, and hear about the highlights and findings, and also hear from a number of impressive partners and key actors in this space. So overall, we have a very exciting program uh, planned for you today. And thank you for being, many of you, uh, the interest that you have shown and for, uh, for being here with us today. Before we start the program with two sets of um, opening um, remarks, and then of course, a very uh, important presentation from the uh, on the findings on the global data barometer and a panel discussion to follow. I wanted to just go over some of the housekeeping matters with you. I hope you see this slide uh, that gives you some information on interpretation and also how that this program is uh, being translated in, is in English, but it's also being uh, translated into uh, French and Spanish. And if you find the and this in the control buttons that you have, if you see the interpretation and you click on that, you can actually flip to the language that you prefer uh, to listen to for this program. Um, 
we, we have a packed program for you, but we also want to still hear from you on comments and questions. So please use the chat as I see you are doing very actively. Please use the chat to uh, make any comments or any questions that you have. We will try to attend to them and also take them as feedback for the future uh, programs on GDP. We also wanted to um, share with you that you can watch this program uh, via YouTube on GDB channel and on in, in English and in Spanish on ILDA's channel. And if you have any friends that you or colleagues uh, or your network that you want to tweet and inform them if they don't have to register now, they can actually go to one of those channels and watch this program. So let's get on with the program. And I'm very delighted to introduce to you our first speaker, Caroline Ford. Caroline will be doing our opening today. Uh, she is the director of the International Development Research Center, IDRC's Democratic and Inclusive Governance, where she leads the innovative research teams working with Southern institutions on inclusive, accountable, and transparent governance so that everyone can claim their rights and influence the decisions that impact their lives. Caroline, over to you. You are muted, Caroline. It just wouldn't be 2022 if somebody didn't do that. So, Sounds perfect now. Yes. So there you go. So thank you very much for the introduction, Shida. And hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Depending on what part of the world you're joining us from, Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us today for the launch of the first ever edition of the Global Data Barometer. Now, as you know, an ever-increasing amount of data is produced, collected, and used every single day. And when data is used to inform more inclusive and democratic decision-making, it has the potential to improve lives, transform economies, and help to end poverty. At the same time, we have seen that data can also be used in ways that may enrich, uh, sorry, entrench inequalities, infringe on individual rights and undermine democracies. So how do we ensure the responsible use of data for all? More than ever, the world is grappling with the potential positive and the negative in, uh, implications of the use of data when combined with rapidly emerging digital technologies. Because of this, we need to address critical knowledge gaps in our efforts to build more accountable institutions and to govern data and technology in order to support a more inclusive development. The new global data barometer is a foundational contribution to these efforts. So I'm speaking to you on behalf of IDRC. IDRC invests in high quality research in developing countries and we share knowledge with researchers and policymakers for greater uptake of this, of this data and evidence and use and mobilize global alliances to build a more sustainable and inclusive world. Our Open Data for Development program, which was jointly funded by Global Affairs Canada and the Hewlett Foundation, provided support for several, several editions of the Open Data Barometer. Building on the successes and lessons from this past work, we knew that a new tool was needed to reflect the changing times and increasing complexity of our data-driven world. We needed a new tool to explore the issues outlined in the recent World Development Report, Data for Better Lives, and we were glad to work with the World Bank on consultations that informed both the World Data Report and this new barometer. And we're very glad to have Haishin Fu from the World Bank here today. Thank you for joining us. During the past two years, the Global Data Barometer has brought together global experts to design and implement a new tool that goes beyond the issues of openness in government data. It allows us to have today, for the first time, a comparative view of data governance, capabilities, availabilities, and use in over 100 countries. At its core, the barometer is a new global benchmark on the use of data for public good. It provides key knowledge evidence that can be transformed into practical advice and actions by governments and stakeholders alike. Thematic partners were crucial in development of the questions and the indicators that reflect international good practices, allowing independent research to take place by a global network of regional hubs. Um, <sighs> 
And so we are so pleased to see the results of these efforts today. The global data barometer is also more than a benchmark. We believe that this type of research is critical to catalyzing strategic coordination amongst thought leaders so that we can mount a coherent effort to advance the use of data to address development goals on the global level. The barometer has provided a unique platform for collaboration that will help us advance on such issues as climate action, company information, health, land, political integrity, public finance, and public procurement. We are looking forward to seeing how these collaborations and dialogues will continue. So congratulations to the thematic partners that helped develop this tool, including GIFT, the Open Contracting Partnership, land portal and open ownership and thank you to the open government partnership and transparency international for joining us today and providing your unique insight into how you will use this data to advance your work we would also like to congratulate all of the regional global uh, the gdb regional partners we are very keen to continue to explore how these regional research hubs can help strengthen data systems around the world particularly in the global south i'm looking forward to hearing from ldri the regional hub in east africa on the opportunities to advance this agenda specifically in the african context finally we would like to con uh, congratulate ilda a leader institution from the Global South for its role in coordinating this global project on behalf of the Data for Development Network. We know that this was not a process without challenges. It had to be developed in a world fighting the most significant pandemic in a century. So congratulations to Silvana Fumega and the entire GDB team for your leadership in bringing us to today's launch. At IDRC, we are committed to supporting the creation of a data for development network that will help us advance research, policy, and solutions that will help us to tackle the gaps identified in the barometer. We are committed to help mobilize the voices and knowledge of the Global South to help shape the global data agenda, building capacity amongst governments, individuals, and organizations, and increase cooperation amongst experts, donors, and institutions to drive the innovative use of data to address development challenges. As a first step, together with ILDA, Research ICT Africa, and other partners around the world, we have established a Data for Development Global Research Hub that will work to mobilize this type of knowledge into action. We hope that the collaboration with the thematic areas and the regional partners will continue and deepen in the future. It will be important to continue to work together to explore how to build trust around the protection of personal data within our society, how can the private sector and civil society help to untap the value of data use and reuse for purposes such as political integrity and climate action, and how the potential benefits of applied data can reach those most in need, particularly women and girls. As we know, data and, and data systems are vital for monitoring and helping to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. Thus, we are honored to have Francesca Ferrucci from the UN Statistical Division with us here today. At IDRC, we see firsthand the power of data to improve lives. We believe that reliable data can inform policy that improves health, education, economic, agriculture, climate adaptation, and other outcomes. Put bluntly, we can't achieve the sustainable development goals without data, and we're looking forward to discussing with the international community how the barometer and how our data for development efforts can contribute to strengthen data systems and support the achievement of the SDGs. Thank you. And thank you, thanks to you, Caroline, for those amazing opening remarks for our event today and, and very important points that you made on the importance of the GDB being also providing a platform for collaboration and also uh, the linkage to SDG, which is a great segue to our next speaker, Francesco Perucci. Uh, let me introduce Francesca to you. Many of you who are in the data field probably know her. She is the Assistant Director of the UN Statistics Division, where she oversees their work on data for development, open data, data integration, and dissemination, and other global data, many global, different global uh, initiatives. Uh, throughout her UN career, those of you who know her know that she has been an active leader in developing and promoting the use of data and statistics for development and has pioneered new approaches for producing, analyzing and communicating data to be used effectively for policy and decision making. 
So let me turn the, um, the virtual uh, platform to you now on, uh, on giving us your opening remark, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheda, and hello, everybody. Uh, and thank you so much to our, my D IDRC colleagues and the D4D group for inviting me to be part of this event to launch the Global Data Barometer. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, this is the culmination of very intensive work uh, that has involved a large number of, of researchers, uh, which offers a, a, an important view of, of data practices and policies in countries around the world and will certainly uh, contribute to a better understanding of the needs for support and cooperation for better data. Uh, we are at a very critical time uh, in the evolution of the data ecosystem. <clears throat> National data systems have become increasingly complex uh, with more demand for timely, relevant, open and sufficiently disaggregated data uh, as we've seen very clearly during the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, uh, we see more opportunities to integrate multiple data sources, including from outside the traditional boundaries uh, of the official statistical system, from citizen generated data to private sector data, but also new tools and technologies that facilitate data collection and the integration and use and reuse of data sets. And these changes come with our own challenges related to privacy, security, data ownership, uh, and an urgent need to develop uh, robust uh, data governance and, and stewardship models. It's clear that uh, within this changing ecosystem, there is a need for a system-wide approach to understand and manage these uh, different dependencies and structures and, and for better data governance. I was heartened to see that governance is a, indeed a core pillar of the global data barometer. And I'm excited for the learnings uh, we can apply from your findings. Uh, this is a topic that uh, we at the UN, uh, with the UN Statistical Commission, which is the intergovernmental body of, of chief statisticians from around the world, uh, we are watching this very closely. In fact, there was a working group on data stewardship established last year uh, to provide guidance to national statistical offices in this area. Uh, there are different work streams uh, that will develop a shared work, uh, framework to define data stewardship, uh, discuss challenges related to privacy and governance, understand the role of data stewardship at the city level, and illuminate the role of data stewards in guaranteeing equity and inclusion. And this last piece, again, related to equity and inclusion is another topic that is also core to the GDB, to the Global Data Barometer. But as we heard from uh, Caroline, uh, with less than eight years until 2030, the demand for data to realize the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and also address the challenges of the multiple crises we're facing has not yet been met. And while data are central to achieving the SDGs, many countries still do not have the resources to produce the data and statistics uh, that are sufficiently accurate, timely, disaggregated, interoperable, easy to use, so that the, the informed, uh, the, necessarily, the necessary informed uh, decisions can be made. So why is uh, progress so slow? Uh, one of the major barriers is low investment in data and the siloed approach to financing data, which is partly driven by donors. This is why tools like the Global Data Barometer are key as they help highlight system-wide gaps they help identify the areas for improvement and investment and, and good practices that can be scaled up. So we've seen that capacity monitoring tools like uh, such as the World Bank SPI, the Odin produced by Open Data Watch are very useful and important in our understanding of the official statistics space. And I'm confident that the GDB's, GDB's uh, focus that goes beyond official statistics will also help fill critical knowledge gaps. So I'm looking forward to, the, to learning more from Silvana's presentation today and the discussion of all the distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, and we'll be back at the end of our time together to reflect on our learnings and uh, talk a little bit about the way forward. Over to you, Sheda, and thanks again. And thank you. Thanks, Francesco, for, uh, for your opening remarks and also the um, pointing the, the importance linkages to the intergovernmental work at the UN Statistical Commission and the governance and equity and inclusion, and of course linked to SDG and how the, the data barometer could really be a helpful um, 
service or help with helpful input to this work. Now let's go to Silvana's uh, presentation. We've all been waiting for that. Uh, let me introduce, for those of you who don't know Silvana Fumega, she is the GDB, the Global Data Barometers Project Director, as well as the Research and Policy Director for ILDA, the Latin America Open Data Initiative. She has served as a consultant for several international organizations, governments, and civil society groups. And in the past few years, she has focused her work a lot on the intersection of data and inclusion. Silvana, you have a very difficult task ahead of you of taking us through this really super rich amount of information that you have uh, from the result of the GDB, 105 page of report, many websites, many data sets. So you have 15 minutes to take us through that, but not talk too fast for the interpreters, my dear. Thank you, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Shaira. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Hola a todos y a todas. Uh, as Shaira mentioned, it's going to be a difficult task, so please bear with me. I'm going to try to condense two years of hard work into 15 minutes of presentation, so I'm going to do my best to give you the, the main points for you to, to go into the website and also into the report and check all the results and see for yourself uh, what been working well we've been working for in the past uh, two years. So I'm gonna share a presentation there. Hopefully everybody uh, can see it clearly. So I'm gonna tell you that today uh, we are launching the Global Data Barometer results. I mean, this is the first edition. And let me start by saying that the goal of the barometer is to provide a new benchmark and the key data needed to better understand the state of data for public good around the globe. It draws some primary data from a global expert survey carried out in, 20, in the mid of 2021, in the middle of the pandemic as well. It was some of the obstacles that we had uh, in this project. And um, it's also combined with secondary data from trusted sources to generate a range of metrics. As this is a collective effort, I'd like to acknowledge all the people to the team as well as consultants and organizations that have been part of this project uh, and without them, it wouldn't be possible uh, to get to this point and to deliver the results today. Specifically, ILDA, as it was mentioned, IDRC. Uh, thank you, Caroline, for, for being here today with us. Also, Fernando Perini, and from the D4D network, also I'd like to thank Stephen Walker, as well as the contribution from UNFPA. I want to acknowledge also the work of the regional partners, the regional hubs, which coordinated more than 100 research researchers around the world. And also another key part was uh, played by the thematic partners who provided expertise in the development of modules, as well as for the review and analysis. We also uh, have an excellent group of research advisors, uh, and I can really can thank enough to them. You can check their names and just for the sake of time in our website, but I, I'm really grateful to all of you uh, at the research committee. So just to start, I just want to say that the global data agenda has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. Initially, the main focus was on openness, particularly of public data, under the assumption that better open data would deliver better development outcomes. That's the reason the Open Data Barometer, or ODB, the predecessor of our study, was set up in the first place. Today, we are talking and thinking much more about issues such as privacy, protection of human rights in the development of technological interventions, AI, digital security, inclusion, and data governance within countries and across them. All these topics can no longer be ignored. This increased complexity of the data agenda has at best only been partially reflected in global measurements until now. So in this context, the GDB has been designed to respond to these issues and to fill critical knowledge gaps on how data policy and practice are unfolding in different sectors, regions, and countries around the world. This new benchmark looks at the landscape beyond just open data and through a series of thematic lenses, such as land, political integrity, climate action, health and COVID, public contracting, company information, and public finance. And I'm gonna show you here some of the numbers. 
uh, of this first edition. Basically, uh, we have uh, 109 countries, 12 regional hubs, six thematic partners, 39 indicators, and more than 60,000 data points inside the report and on our website. You will also find information about more than 1,100 data sets, more than 900 frameworks, and more than 70 open data initiatives. Please visit uh, globaldatabarometer.org to check out all this data and much more. So what is in there? Uh, this benchmark looks at data issues through four pillars. Those are data governance, capabilities, availability, and the use of impact of data for the public good. The indicators, the 39 that I mentioned before, fit these four pillars with two core modules, which assess data governance and capabilities throughout the country, and seven thematic modules. Five of these uh, revolve around money, accountability, and power, and they were developed in partnership with expert organizations. Those are, for example, political integrity in partnership with Open Government Partnership and Transparency International, public procurement in partnership with Open Contracting, company information in partnership with Open Ownership, public finance in partnership with the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency, and land in partnership with Land Portal. There are also two pressing issues that are climate action and health and COVID. I'm gonna show you a little bit the main structure is just to give you an idea about uh, what we've been doing and what is the data that we've been gathering for the past two years. In order to gather all this data, regional partners hired national researchers who were trained according to our handbook and all the materials we provided. And after the researchers did the field work with the help of coordinators in each of the regional hubs, a review was conducted also with the key support of our thematic partners. All of the data collection and the review process was conducted during the second half of 2021. In spite of that, responses and justifications will be available on our website. You can go there now if you want and check it. And also a feedback channel in order for you to share any comments or questions to help us continue to improve our work moving forward. The data collected allow us to show how countries are performing against each module. However, I want to highlight that GDP is more a rating than a ranking. In that sense, primary indicators and scores <clears throat> are based on a zero to a hundred scale, where a hundred is designed to measure best practices defined against internationally agreed frameworks. So while comparison between countries can be used to look for relative strengths and weaknesses, the greater value in this model, in this model is in showing individual areas for improvement in each country and enabling them to target and track improvements over time. Moreover, the barometer norms are designed to be attainable. In that sense, if we take the maximum score given on each indicator and construct an imaginary country that combines, combines sorry, the best performance found across each of the countries, it could score 95 for 92, proving that virtually all countries should be able to attain high scores with time and effort. Now I'm gonna be providing a brief breakdown of the results by region, but of course you are gonna be able to see all the details again in our website and report. So here we go with Africa. The barometer covers 22 countries and the region scores somewhat below the global average on all pillars, identifying a significant need for investment in data governance institutions, robust and comprehensive data infrastructures and in capacity development to manage and use data for public good. Nevertheless, the region also has a number of solid open data policy frameworks to belong Although sustaining resources and support for open data initiatives remains a key challenge for the future. The next one is Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Here we cover 15 countries and the region scores marginally below the global average on the capabilities pillar with significant variability in where countries stand with regard to data skills, institutions and the freedom to use data for public good. The region scores marginally above the global average on use and impact, reflecting civil society-led uses of data. Strengthening data governance and adopting more multi-stakeholder approaches to promoting 
management, availability and use of data for the public good are key areas in the region in the years ahead. One large region uh, is the one that covers 20 European Union countries, the United Kingdom, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Israel. This is a group defined by generally high levels of national income and data related capabilities. Comparable governance scores hide some significant differences between countries, with some of them strong on sectoral rules for data disclosure, while others are stronger on the universal applicability of data protection frameworks. Continued work on that inter inter interoperability, improving subnational capabilities, addressing issues of equity and inclusion in data collection and use should be of particular uh, priority for countries in this group. Now we have the Latin America and the Caribbean regions. I mean, these two sub regions cover 23 countries. And despite, that the fact, despite the fact that mean scores are lower than the global average on governance and capability, the region has made progress on data availability and use, reflecting in particular the role of community led open data initiatives. <clears throat> Further development on participatory and inclusive approaches to data policy and stronger frameworks to govern data sharing and algorithm use of data should be on the agenda for the region in the coming years, alongside work to strengthen sectoral open data initiatives through ongoing peer learning. <clears throat> now we have uh, Middle East and North Africa. In this region, we cover eight countries. And while the region is significantly below the global average on governance, data ability, and use and impact, it is comparatively strong in terms of both government and private sector capability to manage data with limits on capability scores shaped by restrictions on political freedom. Further developing partnership models that can harness capacity in the private sector to promote use of data for the public good offers one route to deepen support for data reuse. There is also a need to focus on ensuring a quality of access to the benefits of data and protection from potential harms. And now we have South and East Asia covering 15 countries and the diversity of countries within this region is reflected in the significant variation in regional scores across all four pillars. Despite the widespread presence of open data policies and initiatives, publication of key data set could be much stronger, particularly in relation to political integrity, company information, and climate action. Now, I'm gonna move into some of the thematic findings. I'll share a few of the main observations, including in our report, and again, you can check many more uh, in our website and in our data. That is open, by the way. Uh, nowadays, Two of the most urgent matters affecting the world, as we know, are climate action and COVID. However, we are going to see here the way in which data is produced and published related to these issues varies significantly. The global response to COVID-19 has demonstrated that the new data infrastructures can be built rapidly. Yet, when it comes to climate data, there are significant gaps in the availability of emission, biodiversity, and climate vulnerability data sets, as I'm showing here in the other second graphic. Data should be available to support local action on combating and adapting climate change, but is often only available in aggregated and out-of-date forms. We think that our evidence has the potential to support participatory actions on improving climate data ecosystem by helping communities to identify and compare good practices. Now, moving on into political integrity. This is the largest module on our, on our survey, and the, there is a wealth of information uh, related to this particular topic. But the main takeaway is that if countries that are already providing political integrity information online were to shift from paper-based processes to collecting and publishing structured data, they could unlock new approaches to accountability. Also, although a lack of interoperability among political integrity data sets remain a key problem in many countries, our data can be used to explore bright spots and examples of best practices. We have also provided a new baseline evidence on the prevalence of rules for disclosure, 
and we highlight the lack of a structured data available, for example, related to lobbying, marking a target for greater disclosure to be tracked in the future. In the case of finance and contracting, the relatively high levels of structure and open data publications detected by our survey for government budget and spending data, as well as for public procurement data, suggest a positive influence on, of global campaigns and capacity building initiatives in promoting data publication and use. However, a closer look at the available data also reveals that while data is increasingly available on the input side of public investment, for example, budget allocation, contracted tenders and awards, there is a still a significant progress still to be made in tracking the output side. For example, by providing showing up data on the implementation of contracts or the details on the impact of spending, particularly on issues of equity and sustainable development. Now, getting close to the end, I'd like to provide some general observations on the state of the data for public good. First, developing and using data for the public good is possible. As mentioned before, virtually all the norms established by the barometer are in theory attainable today. However, the score show us that there is still a long way to go. Also, when thinking about open data, is still a key component of these measurements, we could say that open data chain is still alive, but no longer progressing in a linear way. It is not increasing at the same rate that it was a few years ago. In that sense, also new national open data initiatives have, have been launched since 2016, others have disappeared completely. However, in those instances where initiatives have been sustained, there are often now better resources and more embedded than they were in the past. And open data principles have been embedded in a number of sectorial initiatives. Next, I'd like to point out that capacity gaps, in that sense, skills, training, infrastructure, remain still a significant barrier to delivering value from data. While the digital divide may be narrowing in some places, gaps still exist across governments, the private sector, and civil society in their ability to create, to, sorry, to create and use data for public good. Another key takeaway, is that well-drafted frameworks deliver better data. When rules are explicit about data collection, management, and sharing, data is much more likely to be available, useful, and sustainable in addressing any numbers of issues for public good. And lastly, collaboration between traditional civil society and civil technologies, or between journalists and private sector application providers are driving new uses of data that highlight, for example, corruption, promote public integrity, monitor environmental issues, or shape public policy debate. There is also a clear evidence that partnerships and the work of international organizations in terms of advocacy of certain topics is showing results in terms of advancing the data agenda. I'm just showing here just a, a few examples, but you can find more about these particular examples and also others in our report and also in the qualitative data that you can download from our website. To finish this presentation, uh, a few final recommendations or key actions for the field based on our results for further discussion, discussion here today in the round table and moving forward. Uh, those who want to realize the potential value of data for the public good must work together to first, stress on leadership and strategies to scale up and embed the skills, infrastructures and freedoms required for data to be governed and used for the public good. Also, to develop robust data sharing frameworks, including at the subnational level, so that potential data abuses are limited and the positive reuse of data is enabled. Deepen the emphasis on equity and inclusion, recognizing that data governance, capability, availability, and use all need to explicitly consider the needs of marginalized populations. And lastly, increase the transparency of government data use by making the public more aware of when governments are collecting, sharing, or using data. This can promote more accountable data practices and support greater collaboration across, across sectors in using data effectively.
Once again, I invite everybody to explore our website, to check all the results, to download the data by country, by module, by region, and any additional findings in the, in the report. I'm looking forward to the conversation that is coming next, and I, I really want to acknowledge uh, and thank all the speakers in this event uh, for their support to the project and for sharing their thoughts and valuable time with us. On a final note, I want to personally acknowledge and thank the work of some of the people behind this project, Nicolás Grossman, David Sabora, Tim Davis, Fiona Chaguana, Katrina Cortez and Violeta Belver, and also those who are working today here to make this event possible, Juan Diego Streaming, Sofia Donner with some graphic summaries, and our four interpreters in the Spanish and French channels. So I'm gonna stop here and thank you so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your feedback, your comments and your discussion. Thank you and back to you, Shaira. Thank you, thanks Silvana, and thanks for this really outstanding presentation, taking us through the GDB in the past uh, couple of years, not only how you manage this work, but also the highlights of the result, but also what the results are telling us in terms of some of your uh, recommendations and the wealth of information you provide. I highly recommend all our uh, audience to actually uh, look up uh, this wealth of information on at the report, but also the website and um, uh, and you know, of course, uh, in, download the data. And if you are journalists in the in the crowd, please write about this and uh, try to you know entice uh, use of this data. Really important wealth of information available. And I really like your recommendation going forward, uh, Silvana. And that's really a good for increasing leadership, increasing the transparency of the data use, increasing the inclusion and equity in data, and you know, really getting more value from the data. And that's really a good segue to our next section, which is a very exciting roundtable discussion with four very distinguished uh, speakers that I would present, and and then we'll we'll see them each one on one, one by one, um, talking to us um, two, in two runs of questions that I would have for them. Our first panelist is Muchiri Nyaga, who's, not, uh, who's known to many of you in the audience from Local Development Research Institute in Nairobi, Kenya. Muchiri is the co-founder and the executive director of the Local Development Research Institute, LDRI, an action-oriented think tank supporting efforts of African Union member states to take evidence-informed actions to end extreme poverty and hunger and reduce inequalities. LDRI also serves as one of the largest regional research hub for the GDB. So congratulations to you, Muchiri, for this work as well. The next sp speaker is Delia. Ferreira Rubio, who is the chair of the Transparency International. Very big welcome to her. She is also a member of the Vanguard Committee of World Economic Forum Partnership Against Corruption Initiative, member of board of the UN Global Compact and co-chair of the Global Future Council on Anti-Corruption of the World Economic Forum. Then we were, we were going to have Aishan Fu, the director of the World Bank's Development Data Group, but unfortunately she had an emergency, cannot be with us, but I'm really delighted to have Craig Hammer in her place. Craig is a program manager with the Development Data Group at the World Bank. He is one of the co-authors of the 2021 World Development Report, Data for Better Lives, and manages the World Bank's Global Data Facility, which is the new bank-hosted trust fund to support low- and middle-income data priorities. Welcome, Craig. <clears throat> and then we have Joe Foti, who is the Chief Research Officer of the Open Government Partnership, where he leads the analytics and insights team, which is responsible for major research initiatives. He has over a decade of leading research and accountability efforts across a range of sustainable development issues. His most recent major work was as the chief editor of OGP's first global report, Democracy Beyond the Ballot Box. 
So I will be moderating the panel and we'll go through two rounds of question. Each round of the question, the panelists would have about four minutes uh, to share with us their thoughts. I think I'm gonna start with you, Muchiri, if you don't mind, because you've also been a partner with uh, Silvana in the work of the GDB. Muchiri, the question that I have for you is, I'm interested in your unique regional perspective. Could we ask you to give us your sense of GDP exercise and results from an African perspective? And what do you think the applications might be related to the work of LDRI, working on local development issues? Over to you, Muchiri, for four minutes. Thank you, Sheda. Um, and, and thank you, um, everyone, for um, you know, everyone who's worked on this, uh, Silvana, the team, and all the support from, from our partners. Uh, this is a, a seminal moment, I think, in moving and trying to advance the work that we're doing, especially around, you know, measuring progress when it comes to data for development. Um, for me, there are uh, a lot of areas where, where the, the, the GDB report um, has kind of nudged our thinking in terms of what, what we need to think about going forward. Uh, but I, I think what I'm, I'm really excited about was the fact that the report does uh, draw those linkages that um, in, in some instances we would have wanted to do deep dives and never had the chance to, and the GDB did that for us. Uh, th those linkages, for instance, between governance and capability on one hand and um, av availability and use on, on the other when it comes to data for development. Um, and I think one of the areas that becomes very clear at that, at that nexus is the, the, the role of strong institutions. Uh, in, in, uh, as the researchers uh, reached out and, and talked to people and looked at websites and looked at reports, it became, became clear that there's a, a, a place where a strong institution that's operating in an, in an enabling environment that's really undergirding its work, um, that it's able to achieve things which uh, you know, peers or compatriots in, in not as enviable circumstances are able, are, are able to, to achieve. Um, so that, that, that relationship between um, you know, having strong institutions and, and looking out to see whether the data is there, whether it's being produced, whether it's being used, that, that, that was a very clear um, linkage. And you'll see it in, in a lot of parts of, um, of the report. And I think that shows us that uh, data doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists within a context, and that context is, is uh, the, the political issues that are happening, the environment, the enabling environment that exists for institutions and actors to get their jobs done, and not just government side um, actors, but also public sector, I mean, pub, uh, civil non-state actors, um, and of course, those public um, institutions that are independent institutions, your independent commissions, et cetera, that are all playing a really important role in trying to establish you know, a very strong environment for, for data and development, um, especially around uh, transparency, accountability, and, and participation. Um, I think we, we did see um, an area that, uh, two areas I think that are worth highlighting. One, uh, the issue of the civil service and the capacities within the civil service. Within that conversation on capabilities um, as, a, as a pillar within the report, you see um, highlighted the, the fact that there is a lot that needs to be done in terms of building the capabilities of governments uh, where the civil service is concerned on data and digital. Um, and I know we might see sometimes that as a, as a, as a, as a data for development um, issue specifically from that lens, uh, but if you if you are to walk into many 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 governments, this this would actually fall under human capital development issue, um, and I think that was a striking thing for me because the institutions that are usually uh, responsible for human capital development in the public service, uh, uh, broader government, don't typically tend to be uh, in the room when we are talking about data, open data, etc. Et and that that tells me that that may have been a disconnect that has not served as well over the last ten years. Um, across across African countries, then we are beginning to work on advancing open data, um, and that I think also affects our ability to make sure that we have ring fenced um, uh, domestic resources for data capacity and, and, and data for development more broadly, uh, and of course the very visible um, high level government champions who are uh, pushing for that civil service uh, capacity development that is necessary for us to see. You know, data for development really advanced.
that we, while we were growing at a steady clip um, in, the, in, the, in the early years, in terms of how much data, which initiatives are coming online, uh, that, that, that clip uh, has slowed to a, a crawl across, across the continent, across many parts of the continent. Um, and it, it, that, that linkage goes back now to, to a, that conversation around capabilities. And I think that is, and governance, which I think that's, a, that's an area we need to really double down on. Um, if we have the li right leadership and the domestic resources are, uh, are, are available outside of development partner support, which has been very critical in moving, um, uh, advancing issues around, around data and data use on the continent. Um, if once, once the, 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 the resources are, are ring fenced, they're predictable, they're there, you have a civil service that's able to execute uh, uh, people who are dedicated in their, their dedicated uh, resources and uh, human resources to the, to the open data initiatives, Chances are, you know, as the report points out, those are the ones that we still see are still alive today, still, still growing, still thriving. Um, but those that didn't, uh, weren't able to mobilize that support um, are, are middling and some of them have disappeared. And that, that, that's a signal for me in terms of what, what we now need to start thinking about, you know, going forward. And the, the GDP does provide us with that uh, well, sort of a true north in terms of what our programming uh, does does need to focus on. Um, in addition to making sure that this time round, as we work on building capacities for data, that we have uh, every part of government think about a whole of government approach to the issues of, of of data. So that we're not working in 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 silos, we're not continuing those efforts in small boxes, but we are advancing, you know, as a whole of government approach so that we have the public service. Uh, especially the parts that are responsible for, for, for capacity development in the room. We have the, the, the institutions re responsible for access to information in the room. We have the institutions responsible for resources and planning in the room, the national statistics offices. Really, a lot of those who are really necessary. Um, and I think that is one of the, or a couple of the ways that I think uh, GDB has really highlighted where we need to put our, our efforts in the, in the next phase of our work. Um, and uh, provides those of us working on, on access uh, to information and, and accountability with uh, with that true north to work towards. Um, so I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Shayla. Thank you. Thanks, Michi. That's tremendously important, particularly um, as we said for from you know for the for the for Africa, this linkages and uh, looking at the enabling environment and the need for capacity building and financing. So tremendously important. Thank you for that. Uh, next question I have is for you, Delia. Um, you, you have a very important uh, perspective that you could bring to this discussion. What can you tell us about how the barometer results sync with transparency international assessment of the current situation? And how might this new data be useful to you in your work? Over to you, Delia, for four or five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shaida. And uh, let me start by congratulating uh, Silvana and the team that has been working on this, a big team of uh, researchers. Uh, and thank you for inviting Transparency International to be a thematic uh, partner on one aspect that you cover, which is political integrity. For us, political integrity is the access to an exercise of power for the common good. And that is uh, why data and uh, uh, the availability of data is so important for us. Data has to do with political integrity in many, many aspects. Accountability, good governance, democracy, representation, participation, of course, anti-corruption. All these aspects has to do with the availability of data. We need data in order to improve political integrity around the world. So this work is very, very important because it shows how countries are doing in terms of um, facilitating the access of this very crucial data and how data is governed, which is a very important point. I think the approach of analyzing governance, availability, capability, and the use of data is of key importance in order to really assess the quality of the data that we are using 
for public policy for anti-corruption. In terms of political integrity, which is the field we, uh, our team has been working with you, um, there are four very important areas or points that are considered. Lobby, one which is, uh, has already been mentioned by uh, Silvana, but also asset declaration, which is key in terms of detecting, preventing, uh, and solving conflicts of interest, and you influence, etc. Also, political finance. Political finance is at the core of the corruption problem in our world. It is the window of opportunity for corruption, and it has to do with all aspects of corruption you can mention, and all the areas in the use of public uh, and um, private sector uh, capabilities for the common good. So political finance is one of the key issues here and one of the weakest as uh, Jorge Valladares uh, from our team has already uh, mentioned in the chat. And the last point is consultation. And that's very important because um, open data is great, but it's just a tool for better and strong participation. And without participation, we are not going to resolve the erosion of democratic institutions that we are witnessing around the world in these days and the restriction on the civic space. So having all this in, in account and uh, taking into account, we uh, really cherish the work and the information that this barometer provides us on public integrity. And you know, of course, that data is useful on condition of it to be friendly, um, accessible, uh, usable, on condition that databases are interoperable. That's key in terms of political integrity. Also, the need to have updated and verified data is central for public integrity. And I like very much the point that uh, Silvana made very clear. This uh, new area of work goes beyond just open data. We are talking here about the need for a proper governance on data and data being used for the public good, but in full respect on human rights, particularly when we are talking now in the digitalization of public decision making. Uh, I'm talking of algorithmic uh, machine learning, et cetera, where data is key in order to produce um, non-biased and non-discriminatory uh, decisions. Uh, the team that has been working with the data provided by the barometer uh, at TI is um, led by Jorge Valladares and John Bruschi, and they have, um, they, they still are working on the analysis of the huge amount of data available on public integrity. But one thing I would like to highlight, and with this I will end uh, now, is one, one important thing is the huge gap, which in many regions are between governance, performance, and availability. And this is something that is repeated in many other aspects of the work of Transparency International as an anti-corruption organization. The gap between laws and practice is what is um, uh, preventing us from really having impact in terms of integrity, transparency, and accountability. And this is also reflected in uh, um, the field that is analyzed and reported by the global uh, barometer, data barometer. So um, this is something that we have to take into account to keep on working for better data but also for better governance of the data and the implementation 
of those standards and rules and protections that are being established in uh, in the law. So I, I will stop here and come back later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Delia. The very important point, and and thanks for sharing your perspective from the uh, Transparency International uh, side and and linkage to the political integrity and also how this data could be used in building um, more democratic processes, but also what it takes. You know that we need better open data. We need more uh, linkages, and we need more data uh, use of data, interoperable data, and better governance. Thank you for that. Now let's move to Craig. You know this um, um, is very uh, Craig. You also bring a very important perspective here um, from the publication of last year's World Development Report, Data for Better Lives. It had a huge influence on the development um, of the global data barometer. How do you see the barometer as contributing to the observations and recommendations of the WDR? Over to you, Craig. Thanks, Shaida, and, and thanks to all for the opportunity to participate today. As Shaida had mentioned, I'm joining on behalf of my colleague, Haishan Fu, who very much wanted to be here. Uh, let me first congratulate the Global Data Barometer team and the global partners for this major, major undertaking. And we're really, really pleased that the 2021 World Development Report, Data for Better Lives, played a role in the development of the GDB. Uh, we can see a clear line of sight complementarity uh, between the purpose, ethos, and several findings of the Global Data Barometer Report and the 2021 World Development Report on Data for Better Lives, as well as other key World Bank data initiatives. Um, and, and it's great to see that, that harmony. Um, this is great news for several reasons. So just a quick word on the World Development Report. Many of you know that the World Bank's flagship report is the World Development Report. And what makes it important and special is that it's more than just an annual report. Each World Development Report enshrines a position that the bank is taking on a crucial global issue and which will inform and shape the kind of support that the World Bank provides moving forward uh, in the coming years. And so it was just about a year ago that the World Bank launched the World Development Report 2021, uh, Data for Better Lives, uh, which was the first ever World Development Report uh, that focused on the role of data for development. Uh, and it sets out this concept, um, the social contract for data. Uh, it's an aspirational state of affairs that we're now working toward wherein governments and citizens are linked together in a reciprocal relationship that's underpinned by the effective and responsible uh, production of data, analysis of data, and use of data. And the World Development Report emphasizes that, uh, or defines the building blocks of this social contract as three things, value, equity, and trust. These are clear in the ethos in the development uh, of the global data barometer. By value, we mean that economic and social value comes from sharing, reusing, and combining data sources to generate greater insights. By equity, we mean that data production, data infrastructure, and data-driven policies and decisions must ensure that the needs and priorities of impoverished, marginalized, and historically underserved people are identified and met so that benefits don't exclusively flow uh, to elites. And by trust, we mean that all data collection, analysis, management, and use, as well as the data infrastructure being used, must be trustworthy in every sense of the word. Every effort must be taken to protect these processes from misuse and to avoid discrimination or capture. We recognize each of these values in the development of the Global Data Barometer. And we welcome opportunities for alignment and coordination in deploying the barometer with related relevant tools and processes, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, to generate as much value as possible for World Bank client countries. The barometer also closely aligns with one of the key strategic priorities of the World Bank's development data group, where I work, that we like to call open data open code, open knowledge. Uh, just like the World Bank's data publications and data sets, all the evidence gathered by the barometer is published alongside the report as open data, which supports further research and analysis in the spirit of openness and reproducibility. This is extremely important for creating and spreading a culture of transparency and accountability around data with an emphasis on showing our work and enabling auditability as well as reproducibility. This is another way that the global data barometer and our efforts are increasingly aligned. The bank, for example, is increasingly opening our own computations. For example, we just launched something called the Poverty and Inequality Platform. We've been publishing something called the SDG Atlas. Um, and there are other efforts, for example, which are making available as open source code and the code for all statistical calculations and methodological decisions as several key data products on GitHub. Being able to look at the underlying code to check how the bank calculates global poverty estimates and being able to pro propose improvements 
is extremely important, being able to find definitions for every indicator and clear documentation about every methodological decision, input data, survey metadata, and enabling the public to perform their own computations directly on the microdata that underpins this analysis and estimates is extremely important. More efforts like this are on the way. I'll keep my remarks short, but we're very glad that the Global Data Barometer is helping to lead by example. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. That's very, very important. And thanks for linking this to the, um, to the important work of the, uh, of the World Development Report. So we're, we're now coming to uh, Joe. Uh, um, um, how, I mean, the question that I have for you, Joe, is how do you see the barometer contributing to the development of matrix around openness and open, open government partnership planning work? Over to you, uh, Joe, for if you can summarize in four minutes, I would appreciate it. We are way behind schedule. <laughs> I'll try to do less than four minutes. So um, we are very excited about all of the data in here. I would, the data we've ha uh, had the most hand in and that we've, we've been working on is the political integrity data. And so just in terms of, we've been able to play with the data a little bit, and we're going to have a complimentary report that's going to come out um, in a few months uh, on this. So let me tell you some some highlights um, from that political integrity data that is at the the crossroads of anti-corruption and democracy. So three simple points I hope is first off the global data barometer is newsworthy. Secondly, it's news we can use, and the third thing is it's actually new. It's real new news. So um, let's let me just dive into those. The first thing is you couldn't, the, the case is very clear about what happens when governments become unaccountable. And so having this political integrity data that helps us paint the picture of who is accountable, um, I think this will help us improve services, improve investment, improve security. Second, it's news you can use. And I, here's what I mean is in the open government partnership, when we look for measures of, of data, uh, or any measures of governance, we need to be able to communicate to governments and civil society specifically what they can improve in order to raise their performance in a particular area. And that granularity and the, the ability to, the openness of the global data barometer data is already working. We, we've, we've shared this data in um, the Western Balkans and we've shared it in the uh, Baltic region. Uh, and both the times we've gotten a lot of interest from governments who perhaps didn't know quite how not good some of their data sets were. Um, and so to dive into that, the third thing is that this is new. And that what I mean by that is, it's the first time that we're able to see data on some of the things that everyone um, has been able, has, everyone has agreed is important, but no one has built the cat. No one has gone and just done it. And so let me give you some examples of some of the patterns at the global level that we can look at. First, lobbying. If you can believe it, this many years into everyone knowing lobbying is important, we don't have a database on lobbying. Well, guess what we do now with the global data barometer? And it shows us just how much work at least OGP members have to do, but I, I imagine the pattern's even worse outside. Second, asset disclosure. As Delia said, we know that this is incredibly important. Did you know that the OGP eligibility requirements are based on de jure data and you have to have, you have asset disclosure law in, in OGP? Seven years old, that data. And like, okay. Um, and then the last one is right to information is the world has been relying on uh, de jure evaluations of right to information for so long. And now we can actually see which countries are administering and monitoring and releasing data on the performance of their law. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, I think below my four minutes, I hope I didn't drop out too much. I guess I got some messages that I was dropping out. No, you came across very well. The little bit of a dropout, but it's okay. That came through. Thank you so much, Joe. I have second round of questions, but we are way behind the schedule. So I was wondering if I could just uh, ask one question from all the panelists, and then we go one by one about their future vision and the longer term as how they see um, the work of the barometer and the use of the uh, data barometer in from their perspective and how what what are some of the sort of recommendations or suggestions they have you have so Muchiri, and and 
we will probably have to do one minute uh, flash uh, on each uh, speaker, maximum two. Mushiri, I, I start with you. Can you give us a little bit of uh, future perspective on, on the parameter from your point of view? Over to you, Mushiri. Thank you, Sheda. Um, so the, the, the two, two specific areas that, that come to mind, one, um, I see the GDB's work really complementing the work of the Open Government Partnership, hi Joe. <laughs> um, and I think uh, one of the reasons, you know, just looking at the resources for, for the African countries and looking at the areas that, with the, the, the areas that were, that were ranking uh, weakest, um, a lot of those are anti-corruption related areas. In fact, say for two countries, um, everyone else had issues around public finance um, or public procurement or assets. Um, and that it does give us a direction that the um, multi-stakeholder community working on open government in those countries can really depart with and say, this is something that we need to do something about uh, because we now have the data to measure the extent to which we're making progress. Um, and the second area I see a very close uh, correlation and probably informing the work of the, of the barometer even at, at a regional basis is um, uh, digging a, deep, a bit deeper down and looking at the frameworks that require to be more data aware that are not. Um, we, had, we have now good success with access to information, uh, but are there other areas, other laws, other frameworks that require to be more data aware? And they are not. Silvana said something very important. If, this, if the framework, uh, if there exists a framework, a policy, um, uh, some kind of a strategy that requires for data to be published, you're more likely to have that data being more available, being available uh, the right quality and probably being available more frequently than, than if it's not. So I see, I see that really close correlation and, and partnership going forward. And I, I know I probably crossed into 120 seconds, but uh, I shall stop there. Fantastic. And we'll hear from Joe again, too. Uh, so staying with this future theme, um, Delia, uh, uh, turning to you, what, what is your um, suggestions or recommendations or thinking of uh, going forward? Over Very to you. briefly, I, I have three uh, suggestions. Number one, we, uh, we should work together, all of us, in order to push for stronger international standards on data governance uh, and uh, availability, and to have better and stronger sharing inform information sharing mechanisms, not only at the local national level, but also international. In terms of fighting corruption, this is great. We have to push governments uh, in, in different countries to uh, invest more in oversight. Uh, the mandated agencies, uh, agencies having a mandated agency is one of the issues that can make a difference. So we need to invest uh, in uh, uh, oversight injury uh, to have proper budgets, proper technical tools and the capacity on uh, human resources that they use. And the third one is that we should also encourage the use of data, not only by decision makers, but also by journalists, civic society, and citizens, just as that. We need to use the data in order to make it stronger as a tool for public good. Excellent, excellent um, comments, Delia. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad we are recording this session because we, I want to go back and listen to what you just said again and again. That's very important. All three elements. Um, Craig, over to you again, staying with the future's theme as what would be, what are your thoughts or um, suggestions for going forward in this space? So, so, so as I mentioned a minute ago, we're working now to operationalize and implement recommendations from the 2021 World Development Report. Uh, and, and the key message here is alignment, coordination of efforts to implement findings from the barometer, uh, recommendations from the World Development Report, and include key insights that are available from other kind of key initiatives, the ones that Francesca had mentioned at the top of the meeting, the World Bank Statistical Performance Indicators, uh, ODW's Open Data Inventory, only through joined up approaches can we achieve a really clear view of what support is needed, where, and by whom. 
And we should take advantage of mechanisms designed to help us all join forces in support of these things and deliver country-led solutions and technical support and resources to strengthen and modernize national statistical systems uh, and enable the realization of the social contract that the WDR had identified and which is reflected in the ethos of the Global Data Barometer. An example of this is the Global Data Facility. And I'd encourage people to check that out. But coordination, alignment, um, and collaboration in service of, of service of this agenda. But thanks, Craig. Very important. And, and I realize how connected your comments are to Dilia because Dilia basically tell us what she's, you know, the, the vision should be. And you very well said how we should go about it, the coordination, alignment, and you know, investment. So thank you very much. I think we're getting to a very complete picture. And thanks to GDB for being all bringing all this together. Joe, you will be the, you will have the last word of the panel. Again, staying with the future theme, and you have a challenge from Muchiri for um, for getting OGP to be a bigger platform for this work. So what what do you um, what do you think? How can we take this forward? Yeah, I'll try to keep it really simple and maybe just some advertisements or stay tuned uh, for for the sequels. Um, number one, we're putting together regional fact sheets based on this data for people uh, who are working at the regional level to work with building off of our collaboration with TI and the Global Data Barometer team. Uh, second, we're gonna have country by country reports that really dig deeper down into the data because sometimes you know, we had to buy new laptops to be able to process the number of data points that, uh, that they had here. Um, and we have regional meetings coming up all around the world with OGP where we will be presenting this direct information directly to governments and civil society activists who work in those areas. And my hope is that we're able to um, get them to put this on their agenda. Uh, last two things, of course, are we have the Summit for Democracy. Uh, this stuff fits in really great with Summit for Democracy. It's doable, it's actionable. I hope that uh, we start seeing this in some of the Summit for Democracy uh, uh, commitments and actions for this year of action. And um, I will leave it at that, but we want to work with folks at that, at that level of, of getting these things implemented. And the last thing would be for funders please fund another round of this at least <laughs> uh, so that we can see if any progress is being made um, over the course of the next uh, several years as we try to put our shoulder to the wheel for this. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And uh, as you said, lots of opportunities uh, through OGP that we could take this work forward. Thanks to you and also to OGP and all the work you have done. So. I'm, I really want to thank our, um, our panel panelists for this really exciting uh, discussions. I'm sorry we ran out of time, but there's so much to be said about this important topic and the work of GDB. Um, so I hope the audience found this uh, useful. Now we will finish this segment uh, of, of our work with two, uh, two closing remarks. One, we're going back to Francesca, uh, who gave us some um, uh, remarks at the beginning. And Francesca, coming back to you to sort of close the session for us on what are some of the observations ba based on the discussions that you want to share with us. Over to you, Francesca. Thank you, Sheda. This has been an amazing, amazing discussion. So rich as you, I, I'm happy it's recorded. I want to hear over and over again what this uh, the panelists uh, highlighted and the great uh, the great findings of the gdp uh, well a few things resonate with me very strongly the role of strong institutions that was raised uh, several times and the importance of of having that and not just looking at the data the data production and the data availability and the issue of, of, of data governance. And I see that this measure really helps us because we have measures, strong measures, indexes already to look at the data availability, open data, et cetera. But this is a wonderful complement, I think, for us collectively to also look at all these other aspects, right? So I really look forward to uh, working in a collaborative manner across all these different actors who who are sort of custodians of these measures and, and, uh, and of these uh, studies. Uh, and as, as Joe was saying, uh, the, the, the global data barometer is a news that you can use, right? It's a measure that we can use to communicate this, the importance of data governance, the, 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 the strong institutions, et cetera. And, and it's terribly helpful, I think. Uh, but as, as Craig was saying, uh, keywords here are collaboration, 
coordination and alignment. So we need to use, I think, this opportunity today of this launch as the beginning of, of a new conversation where we can really work together so that these measures that we, we have can be somehow integrated and we can uh, align our messages and have a strong voice uh, when it comes to advocating for, uh, for what needs to be done in countries and globally. And also when it comes to uh, highlighting the gaps and, and, and understand you know, what needs to be done uh, in countries with, with, low, with low capacity and have strong messages you know, to the donor community, to all the partners. So uh, my, my sort of call <laughs> today is to really to strengthen this conversation, continue uh, to work together and uh, on the implementation and use of these measures. Uh, to improve the financing of data, the governance, and, and the capacity overall of, of statistical systems in countries. Uh, I also want to congratulate uh, IDRC for this effort and, 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 and I think for what they're offering, because GDP is really offering the space for this discussion uh, around the, the important pillars of the data ecosystem. So I hope the launch today really represents the beginning of, of this close collaboration and coordination among all those uh, involved uh, in this area of work. And uh, again, thank you so much, great speakers. It was uh, really exciting to hear about all your work. And uh, I look forward to continuing this work together. Over to you, Shada. Thank you. Thanks, Francesca. And thanks for this very important call to action on continuing this good work and also um, um, increasing the collaboration around this space, um, as we've heard from many of our speakers. So um, that's really a strong call to action. Now, the last but not uh, least of our speakers for closing this session would be Steve, Steve Walker, who everybody knows or should know. He's the Director of Data for Development Global Research Hub. So Steve, maybe you can close the session for us and tell us a little bit more of what, uh, what's coming next and, uh, and, and sort of any, anything else we should be looking forward to. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Shada. Um, so uh, it's my honor, I guess, to close out today's amazing discussion with a, a view to our, our future plans for the barometer. But um, before I do that, I just want to add my thanks to our esteemed guests and to the whole GDB project team. It was amazing. That's better. We can see you now. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, uh, having a little bit of a technical difficulty, I guess. Um, uh, I also want to make a, a special thanks to, to Shida uh, for navigating us through today's proceedings in her usual masterful way. Um, thanks very much. Um, for the D4D network, uh, the barometer is the first major release in an ongoing effort to close the global knowledge gap around the use of data to address development challenges while simultaneously addressing inclusiveness and ethical concerns around the potential misuse of data. Um, as we've heard, the, the responsible use of data can help us to achieve the SDGs or uh, understand the continuing impact of the pandemic um, or identify key priority areas for, the, for development in the future. However, we need to know more and share what we know and be willing to work together for the public good. The barometer now will help us to assess strengths and weaknesses you know, around the world related to the use of data so that we can prioritize and optimize and collaborate, you know, create new opportunities for multi-stakeholder collaboration, but only if we take this discussion forward. So we will take the discussion started today and turn it into an ongoing dialogue with a series of events planned for weeks and months to come all around the world. We invite all of you to keep the dialogue going with us and so we ask you to please stay tuned to the globaldatabarometer.org and d4d.net for information on all of these activities going forward. And that's it for today. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. Bye for Thank now. You. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. And with this, we are going
going to close this uh, with this uh, session webinar. I wanted to also thank uh, Carolyn. Thank you for joining again. Uh, a big thank you also and acknowledgement, of course, to Silvana and Steve and the GDB team, but also a very huge acknowledgement to Fernando Perini, who is just been, oh, Fernando, thank you for turning on your camera for us to see you. But uh, thank you for all your effort and all the things that you have done. So I encourage you all, please use the website, ask questions, and, uh, and if you're a journalist, write about it. Um, if you're a researcher, use the data and research it. And, and if you have feedback, you know, provide feedback. Silvana and team are actually welcoming that. And as Steve said, you, this is not the last time you see us. There are going to be a lot more events coming up, and we will be connecting this uh, amazing uh, GDB to World Data Forum and to High Level Political Forum, any other events that's coming out in future. So thank you all, and uh, goodbye from all of us here. By the way, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Shada Badi from Open Data Watch. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> Thanks very goodbye. much. Bye. <clears throat>